video is brought to you by friend of the channel Steel Series, makers of the best keyboards, mice, and headsets on the market. Steel Series are a longtime channel partner that have hooked us up with a 12% discount on any purchase whenever you use offer code SkillUp at checkout. Click below to get in on it or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Lords of the Fallen. No, not that one. The new one coming out with the exact same name, but from a different developer. That's right. If you are confused by the title, then you are not alone. Even now, I'm confused. This is a reboot of Lords of the Fallen, but why would you reboot Lords of the Fallen? That was not a title that gathered unto it a huge amount of brand cash. Lords of the Fallen was released back in 2014, and it was one of the first ever Souls likes. We had Demon Souls and Dark Souls, and clearly those were games that were going to inspire a new generation of action RPG. Sure enough, a few years later, CI Games and Deck 13 released Lords of the Fallen, which most people would characterize as an admirable swing and miss. CI and Deck 13 were clearly going for their own thing in terms of visual design, enemy design, and weaponry, but the setting was a little too close to the gothic horror of Dark Souls, so it kind of lived under the FromSoft shadow, and was also mechanically much weaker with some very clunky movement that just didn't feel great to play. So Lords of the Fallen didn't land super well and it didn't leave much of an impression. Deck 13 moved on from that and went on to create the Surge 1 and 2. And they were both awesome Souls-likes, and I really hope we get a Surge 3 one day. CI Games, though, obviously still held a candle for this franchise, and they promised as far back as 2015 that we would get a sequel, tentatively titled Lords of the Fallen 2. They managed that project internally for a while before signing on a development partner called Defiant Studios in 2018, but they terminated that contract after just 12 months because they weren't happy with the output. Fast forward to 2020, and CI Games established an entirely new studio called Hexworks, and this would be the studio to deliver the Lords of the Fallen game, the one released exclusive to current gen consoles and PC on October 13th. So that's an interesting story, but none of it explains why you would call this game Lords of the Fallen. Just put a two after it or something, or a suffix, or like a catchy remix. You know, two Lords, two full. I don't know, I'm not even gonna finish that joke. I guess that CI Games are banking on the quality of the release to speak for itself, pushing through any confusion, wiping the slate clean, and setting up Lords of the Fallen as a major fixture in the Souls-like subgenre. Are they likely to pull it off? Well, I've played two hours of it at this point, and I feel confident enough to say, maybe. Let's do the specifics first. I was invited by the game's distributor here in Australia to go hands-on with the title for around two and a bit hours, allowing me to sample the opening section of the game up to and including three major bosses. I was playing on a gaming laptop sporting an RTX 3080 Ti. I was using a controller. I was not permitted to capture my own footage, so everything you're seeing here is provided B-roll. But CI Games did provide like 35 minutes of it, which is a lot more than you usually get at these sorts of events. So they certainly aren't holding anything back, which is always great to see. So what did I think? Well, first I gotta say, I really was not expecting some of what this threw at me. For starters, I wasn't expecting it to look as good as it does. Uh, this is running an Unreal Engine 5, and it's easily the best looking Souls-like I have played, at least in terms of raw graphical fidelity. I really, really wasn't expecting the core game mechanic, which actually renders two versions of the game world that you can either see or move between at will. I will talk about this a lot during my video, and you will hear a lot of excitement in my voice when I do so, because this is basically the closest thing we are going to get to a Soul Reaver sequel or reboot in the next few years, and if you know anything about me, you know that I'm immediately all in on anything that plays in that space. The rest of the package was a little more of a mixed bag. On the combat side, I'm reluctant to judge it at this early stage given how little I've played, but it didn't feel as good as what this subgenre regularly serves up, and not just from FromSoft, mind you. Cause the Fallen can feel a little floaty, its combat a little unsatisfying, and its enemy attack patterns very mechanical and predictable. I'm also closely eyeing performance. This is a very good looking game running an Unreal Engine 5, and I wonder how well it will run at release, since I certainly noticed a few issues during my time with it. It was a preview build, so we absolutely cannot prejudge it. Things very likely will improve, but it's definitely something that I would be keen to nail down in my final review. Bottom line though, I suspect that Lords of the Fallen's visuals and dual world mechanic is going to get it over the line, I really enjoyed exploring this world a lot, and I was really keen to continue exploring it. I wasn't loving the combat side of it, but I was loving everything else, and that was enough to get me excited and get me invested in this, and yeah, I definitely want to keep going.
Claws of the Fallen does begin in a character creator. I don't have any footage of that, sadly, but you are able to select from a number of predetermined classes. There are 10 of them or so, with one of them being paywalled behind a deluxe version of the game at first, but you can unlock that later by just playing the game. The classes are your classic mix, your sword and board soldier, your light-footed assassin, a ranger type, a cleric spellcaster, as well as your berserk-inspired swordy boys. You can also create your own totally custom class if that interests you. And there's also one called the Condemned, which is, yeah, he's your deprived. This guy just uses a bucket as his starting melee weapon because that's all he can get his hands on. Probably not the best option for your first playthrough unless you are a glutton for punishment. As you level up, you'll be able to allocate stat points wherever you please, and I believe you can equip whatever weapon or armor you find, meaning that the class choice, like the rest of the Soul subgenre, is really only impactful in the opening hours of the game, and after that, it's very much up to you to build your character however you please. Structurally and tonally, it is very, very Souls-like. There are powerful forces afoot, their malevolent wills shaping the world and events in ways that don't quite work for you, and despite your lowly standing and lack of equipment, you set out to carve your own path through whatever might try to stop you. There are bonfires, which in this case are fallen statues that hold lanterns. You light these lanterns when you find them, giving you a space to respawn, to fast travel to, and also to level up. There are NPCs to chat to, each of which has this dreamy, listless quality to their dialogue, as though half of their mind is on you and the other half immersed in melancholic remembrance. Some of it was placeholder audio in my preview build, but you get a clear sense that Hexworks are aiming at characterization and dialogue that's going to make your average FromSoft fan feel right at home. Same goes for the overall visual design. Gothic horror is the rock on which the Souls-like church is built, and Lords of the Fallen seems to have little interest in shaking those foundations. My preview was set in a few different areas, a village which sprawled upwards to a small cathedral district, sort of like a more resplendent Anolondo or a very tiny slice of Landell. After that, I explore a cliffside region. Imagine the scaffolding on the way down to Blighttown, only with snow instead of sludge and slightly higher FPS. No, I'm joking, it's a lot higher, but we'll come back to that later. All of these locations looked really, really beautiful, and that is no doubt helped by the fact that this game is running on Unreal Engine 5, one of the first games this generation to be doing that. Straight up, when it comes to the raw technical aspects of these visuals, this is the best looking Souls like I've played. The lighting, the ground foliage, the texture depth, draw distances, all of it. I was going through footage trying to find some clips to really show it off, but I quickly came to the conclusion that all of it shows it off. All of it looks absolutely stunning, and obviously good graphics do not a good game make, but they really hurt. I'm not ashamed to admit that a big part of my enjoyment during this preview build was just walking around and soaking up everything on display, and I expect most people who pick this up are going to find similar enjoyment. But the best part of this world isn't how pretty it looks, it's actually what's lurking under the surface of all that prettiness. That's the secret source that makes Lords of the Fallen quite interesting, and let's just say it's a mechanic that is particularly near and dear to my heart. In 1999, Crystal Dynamics, leveraging the power of the PlayStation, pioneered a revolutionary new level design technique in their gothic action game, Legacy of Kane's Soul Reaver. The technique involved caching two versions of the game's world any time the player moved into it. There would be a material plane, the world of flesh and blood and water and stone, and then there was this spectral plane where corporeal forms were shed and matter became more ephemeral. A body of water in the material plane would kill Raziel, but water does not exist in the spectral realm, so Raziel could simply walk through an area that was a moment ago totally closed off to him. Similarly, unique platforms or bridges may only appear in one area or another, forcing the player to think in this additional dimension while trying to find a path forward. It always struck me as passing strange that very few games tried to do what Soul Reaver did with its approach to level design. One of the closest things we got was Titanfall 2 actually, with its time jumping levels that were of course quite different. The medium had something like it, but a lot of that was leveraged into visual impact rather than ingenious puzzle design or opening up new exploration paths. Either way, it was cool because the idea of staying in place but moving through dimensions is always cool. So, I had been paying attention to Lords of the Fallen, but not close attention. I'd seen some trailers, they look pretty flashy. I'd seen some Souls-like combat, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I get it. Another Souls-like, fair enough. I was still keen for it, because I love me some Souls-likes, but I wasn't expecting anything particularly new or innovative. 
So I sit down for my preview and almost immediately I'm introduced to the Umbral Lantern. I bring it up with L2 and its light allows me to peer into the Umbral Realm, the land of the dead that exists parallel to Axiom, the land of the living. The first showcase of this mechanic was a large door which appeared to be inaccessible and unresponsive. It was only when I raised the Umbral Lamp that I could see that it was festooned with Umbral Rot and I had to clear that rot if I wanted to progress. This is where things started to get really wild because not only can I see this umbral world, but at any time with the press of a button, I can transition into it, abandoning my physical form to move into this new space with new pathways, new pitfalls and unique foes which can only be found in this realm. It was here that I'd find these nodes needed to break the umbral rot and after finding a place where I could reincarnate, I came back to the Axiom realm so I could interact with the door and continue on my journey. That was a really conservative showcase of how this mechanic works. Later on, I would discover large gaps between platforms that seemed inaccessible until I held up my lamp revealing a bridge I could walk over. Innocuous walls that seemed to hold no secret could not withstand the lamp's scrutiny, revealing new pathways or treasures. When in the umbral realm, I could use the lamp to pull platforms towards me. At one point, there was a body of water that I couldn't cross. So I transitioned into the umbral realm and I was like, oh yeah, baby, this is just Soul Reaver and I'm totally into this. From a straight up environmental design perspective, this dual world system is brilliant and it makes the process of exploring these very narrow linear spaces very interesting because every square inch of them may hold a secret waiting to be revealed by your lamp's light. It's novel within the Souls-like space since those games are typically focused on combat. The enemies are the puzzle in those games, but here enemies are just one type of puzzle, the other being the relationship between these two worlds. Not for nothing, but the lamp has plenty of utility in combat as well. You can use it to rip the soul out of an enemy, forcing that enemy to slowly float after it. And if you strike that soul, you'll do massive damage. There's a whole other health system at work in the Umbral Realm, one that sees you drawing life essences from these blister things hidden in the environment. It's cool, it's clever, and I really liked it. For me, this is what made my time with Lords of the Fallen really enjoyable. We've played so many Souls-likes to this point, and so many of them are good. The worst thing that any up-and-comer developer could do would just be to make another one without trying to find the differentiating factor to set their game apart. From what I can tell, Hexworks are pinning their hopes on visuals and world design and this dual world mechanic, in large part because they know they've got something good going on in these departments, but also perhaps because they know that when it comes to the combat side of the equation, they're fighting an uphill battle, one that they are unlikely to win. Lords of the Fallen is clearly responding to the biggest criticism leveled at the first game, namely the fact that it was slow and clunky. I played as the Dark Paladin class during this preview playthrough. He wields a big two-hander, he wears heavy armor, and at no point did I feel slow and clunky. He felt very quick, very responsive, positively spry for a man wearing a few dozen kilos of iron plating. In this way, Lords of the Fallen feels fast and fluid and fun in a way that its predecessor just didn't. But it also doesn't feel as good as many of its contemporaries. It can feel a little floaty. Hit detection can be a little wonky. Your core combos don't click together as elegantly as you might like. Enemy animations can be a bit stiff and mechanical. And iframes seem to be a bit inconsistent in a way that benefits the player, but that also looks kind of goofy. There is a melee stance system which does add depth to combat. In my case, I could switch between a stance that focuses on more narrow arcs with longer reach or another stance with wider arcs, but you know, less reach. To be honest, they felt kind of the same, these two stances, but I will say that there are a lot of weapons in this game. So this may have just been one where the stance differences don't feel as potent as it might on others. Enemy design was also not doing a whole lot, to be honest. Again, this is early game, but even then, none of the trash mobs I squared off against posed much of a threat, even when in large numbers. They didn't have the sorts of surprise actions or timing windows that might throw you off your guard, keep you on your toes. For that reason, exploration lacks the tension often present in these sorts of games. It's by no means bad, and I want to be super clear about that. I did not walk away from this game thinking, uh-oh. It was more a case of, okay, I know what this is, and I know where to set my expectations. Obviously, FromSoft games set a very high bar, but I'd argue that Deck 13 did a great job with the Surge's combat, and I think Team Ninja crush it every single time with the likes of Neo and Wulong. At least based on these first two hours, I don't expect that Lords of the Fallen will reach those sorts of combat benchmarks, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. 
Again, I only played one class, one weapon type, and I only fought a few bosses. Maybe it opens up a lot more as I get deeper into it, but for now, I'm much more looking forward to the world design and exploration side of the equation than I am the combat, which I know is going to be a deal breaker for many. But personally, I'm on board with what Hexworks are trying to do here, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keen for more. One thing I'm keeping an eye on is performance. I do want to reiterate that this is a preview build and performance improvements can and likely will happen before launch. But at the same time, we're only around seven weeks from launch, which isn't a huge amount of time. I played on a gaming laptop with an RTX 3080 Ti and it was not running super well. When I started tinkering with settings, I noticed it was set to 4K, max settings, DLSS off. And I'm like, okay, well, there's your problem. So I dropped it to 1440p, I turned DLSS on and it really didn't make that much of a difference. I definitely noticed more than a few frame drops and there were lots of textures that took a long time to load in, both during cutscenes and during regular gameplay. I wouldn't categorize it as worrying, but I definitely file it under watch this space. Remnant 2 recently launched and it was basically the first Unreal Engine 5 game to arrive this generation outside of Fortnite. Remnant 2 has given more than a few PC players plenty of grief on the performance front. So my advice is the same advice I always give, never pre-order and be sure to check reviews before slapping down your cash. There are some performance question marks raised here for me that I'll be looking to get to the bottom of when I do my full review in October. So in closing, I come back to what I mentioned a few times in this review, which is that I am into this. The Souls-like subgenre is often inventive when it comes to visual design or interconnected levels, but puzzle solving is rarely a feature of those worlds. Exploration is about filling your foes, picking up the souls they leave behind, following a path that is usually pretty unmissable. Lords of the Fallen is not like that. I absolutely got stuck at a few points, not on bosses or trash mobs, but on exploration-based puzzles where I wasn't thinking interdimensionally enough. It takes time to wrap your head around it, to be honest. It requires you to be more thorough in the way you explore your environments than most Souls-like demand. But once you get into that rhythm, I found it to be a really rewarding loop. It's a loop that I think kind of makes up for the fact that combat isn't popping off for me as much as I'd like. There's obviously a lot more to play around with that I haven't had the chance to see yet, but some of the combat's foundational elements left me feeling a little lukewarm, which is a bummer, sure, but it's absolutely not a deal breaker for me. I definitely saw enough here to pique my interest. I was worried that this would be just another Souls-like, uninterested in bringing anything new to the formula, but Hexworks aren't going in that direction. They're pushing into some new territory here, or at least new in the modern era, since the parallels to Legacy of Kane are both inescapable and awesome. I'm keen to play more, and I will do so when I review the game in October, so... I'll see you then. Guys, if you've been around the channel for a while now, you'd know that my good friends, Steel Series, they've been supporting what we do around here, and I'm always proud to have them as a partner because they consistently put out some of the best stuff in each of their chosen categories. Mice, keyboards, headsets, and more. All of it is industry leading and award winning, and if you don't believe me, just go look up the reviews. I use Steel Series in my own personal setup. My mouse is an Aerox 5. Absolutely love this thing, whether it's wired or wireless. Super light, super comfortable, and extremely accurate thanks to Steel Series' True Move Air Precision Optimization gaming sensor with true one-to-one -one tracking. What is this mouse gliding on? Why, it's the QCK Prism XL, a plus-size mouse pad with a stylish RGB trim. It comes in a variety of sizes, some of them bigger than your actual desk, for real. My keyboard is this bad boy, the Apex 7. In addition to full RGB and mechanical switches, this thing also sports an OLED smart display and a very comfortable, detachable magnetic wrist. It's a keyboard so good that GameSpot awarded it their best gaming keyboard award, and yeah, I fully agree with that endorsement. My favorite piece of kit though is undoubtedly this thing, the Arctis Nova Pro Wireless Headset. This is basically SteelSeries' flagship product and it's racked up a ton of awards since its release last year. The Arctis Nova Pro Series headset comes in PlayStation, Xbox, and PC variants, but they support multi-system connect, allowing you to connect a PC and multiple consoles at the same time, so you can just switch between them. That's done through this sexy looking dedicated audio controller, which not only handles that, but also lets you control volume, chat mix levels, switch audio modes, tweak EQ, and more. 
It comes in both wired and wireless variants, and if you're using the wireless version, you can hot swap batteries since the headset comes with two batteries that support up to 22 hours of playback each. I got the wireless version, you know why? Because that is the version that has active noise cancelling, something that almost no other gaming headset on the market has, and I absolutely love it. Putting them on and hearing that sound of silence is just so good every time. There are other headsets within the Steel Series range as well, a huge variety to meet whatever your needs might be. Best of all, Steel Series are a channel partner, which means that your boy can hook you up with a sweet discount. Use offer code SKILLUP at checkout to get 12% off your purchase. Any item on the storefront, 12% off, no strings attached. There's a link below. Give yourself the gift of industry leading audio for the games that you love. That's SKILLUP at checkout for 12% off anything. Thanks, Steel Series, for sponsoring the video, and thank you for watching it.